<laughs> and then I've spent even most of my life in a place still further remote than that, meaning Alaska. I've been the teacher of babes in the faith. And here I stand as the head of the faculty that trains other teachers. Look at my predecessor, who was Philaret of Moscow, an aristocrat with multiple doctoral degrees. Look at my predecessor, look at me. There will be comparisons, but they won't be favorable. <laughs> <laughs> he turns to the faculty, where he's now the, the head guy, and says to them, you do not deserve an illiterate hierarch like me. Pray that through my ignorance, nothing bad happens. <laughs> <laughs> and so this genius of a missionary is also one of the most humble hierarchs ever. And then he builds the biggest church in Moscow. <laughs> Christ the Savior. It was built as a war memorial to the, to the soldiers who had died in the Napoleonic campaigns. And um, Stalin hated that church. It was the biggest church in Moscow. It dominated the uh, skyline. And with great fanfare, he demolished it. Mo movie theaters showed the reels of the Christ the Savior Cathedral crashing to the ground. And they did this with the, because they were going to build, they already proclaimed, the tallest building in the world to the glory of world communism, with a huge statue of Vladimir Lenin on the top, bigger than our Statue of Liberty. That was the, and so they demolished the church to show that we're getting rid of all the old ways and we're going to build the new socialist, realist monument. Mm -hmm. Well, they demolished the church, and everyone saw that with, mostly with great tragedy, but uh, they never built the world's tallest building because as they tried, a sinkhole opened up. <laughs> <laughs> so the communist architects had to quickly redesign the building and make it even bigger at the base and taller at the top. They're going to make a new improved version. The sinkhole got bigger. <laughs> in the end, it left a huge hole in the middle of Moscow that it embarrassed the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, as you can imagine. <laughs> Khrushchev in the 1950s, because of this major embarrassment, this big hole in the streets, he lined it with concrete and named it the world's largest swimming outdoor swimming pool. <laughs> with the collapse of communism, you all probably know, the property was returned to the patriarchate. The church that Benjaminov built was reconstructed on the same site with no problems. <laughs> <laughs> when we visit Sitka, uh, you should know, uh, a disastrous fire swept through the town in January of 1966. Seventeen buildings were lost. It spread from a dry goods store up Lincoln Street, consumed several banks, the Finnish Lutheran Church across the street. The last building to be consumed by the fire was St. Michael's Cathedral. Mm -hmm. But this gave the people of Sitka sufficient time to rescue every painting, every icon, every chalice, Everything, we, everything was saved from the original cathedral except the bells and the bell tower, which would have been much too heavy and impossible, and one icon. This will be a little fun for you. you. I want you to find, if you don't know already, the one icon that, that uh, we couldn't rescue. Because it's been replaced, but by an icon that doesn't quite fit where it belongs. If you look carefully at St. Michael's Cathedral, it'll be a little uh, scavenger hunt for you. It, I tell you, the icon that they couldn't get off the wall, and therefore was destroyed in the fire, uh, was replaced by an icon that fits in that place, but it doesn't, it doesn't belong there. You can see it. And it's right out in the open. It's not hidden away. It's in the, almost in the very center of the cathedral. Does it fit iconography, or doesn't fit the It doesn't fit in space. In space. The, the, the space is a different shape completely. Huh. Hmm. But the only one I, but when you see how many icons and paintings there are in the cathedral, it's, it's hundreds, if not a thousand. And the only one, the whole town came, even the chandelier that weighs over 700 pounds, people climbed up and, like, it, the adrenaline must have been something else, because the fire was coming up the street. Their own lives were in danger as they rushed into the cathedral, and they formed a human chain and passed everything out, but everything in the cathedral was the original icons. And that's why we can have communion from the original chalice. Yeah. But you mean, his hand cross, and about, his alley of gospel is there. So, the, the real center of our pilgrimage is to visit the place where Satanists and walked, to, 
to pray at the altar in the exact spot where he also celebrated the liturgy, to receive Holy Communion from the same chalice that he brought from California. And there's the other one that, that, that we use on, only on Pascha and uh, Theophany and Christmas uh, that he brought also, magnificent. You'll see in the display case like museum. But none of these things are used only as museum pieces. They're all brought out and used liturgically as they were meant, meant to be. Yeah. So Yuan Veniminov is one of these most incredible Alaskans. And I, I've lived in Sitka the last year. I noticed that there are, see, there are streets named for all kinds of historic figures. The main street is Lincoln Street, although Lincoln had been assassinated several years before Alaska became uh, American territory. Actually, three years. But the, everybody was still mourning Abraham Lincoln, and the main street was named. I don't know what the name was in the Russian period. Obviously, it wasn't Lincoln Street <laughs> in the Russian time. But it was named Lincoln very soon after the purchase or the sale of Alaska. Now, that's something I, I would like to point out next. Alaska, this territory, was claimed because Vitus Bering in 1828 was sent by Tsar Peter the Great to explore this coast, the coast of Siberia. He was ordered on Peter the Great's deathbed to build a ship on the, West, on the Pacific Ocean and sail along the Pacific coast of Russia until he came to America. The supposition in Europe was that the continents were joined and that if you sailed along this coast, you would wind up over here. But in fact, because of fog and wind, sort of like what we have outside, Bering wound up right up, up in the Chukchi and Arctic Oceans and discovered that the, con the continents were not joined. It's water. And he went back and reported that. Reportedly in 1740s, geographers in Russia and Europe were disputing his findings. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was Empress Anna who said, go back and do it again. At least that's what our history books say. It's not true. It's a lie. Yeah. He was not sent to go back to the Bering Sea and do it again. Because on his second voyage, he never entered the Bering Sea. Bering and Chirikov, the two ships, the Peter and the Paul, sailed to Petropavlovsk, which is how Petropavlovsk got its name. The Petr and the Pavel were the two ships. Petropavlovsk was founded in 1741. The next spring, they left Kamchatka and sailed along the Aleutian Islands without seeing any of them, the fog and wind. The two ships were separated, and Bering landed here. You can tell because he cited Mount St. Elias. It was the Feast of St. Elias, August 2nd on the old calendar, uh, July something on the new. But he, found, he cited this mountain, 18,000 feet, coming straight out of the ocean, the tallest uh, sea level mountain in the world, because it comes from sea level directly up to 18,000 feet. He named it in honor of the prophet Elijah because that was the church feast day. And he basically said, I hereby draw a straight line from the tip of that mountain to the North Pole. And that's how Alaska got this boundary. Mm -hmm. However, one day earlier, Alexei Chirikov landed down here near the village of Medlakadla, which at that time didn't exist. And he staked a claim there. And it took the British and the Russians several decades to decide how to attach Bering's site to Chirikov's. Oh. And that's why this part of Alaska is part of Alaska at all. Of course, it's also part of Alaska because of Baranov. If Baranov had not come back and reclaimed Sitka, the British would have taken all of this anyway. So it's the two of them. But Chitikov got here one day earlier and made it all the way back to Petropavlovsk. Bering and his crew caught scurvy, crash landed on Bering Island, and died and never made it back. Now, in every Alaska history book I've ever read, it always says, Vitus Bering, a Dane in the service of the Russian Tsar, was hired to do this exploration. The inference was there weren't any Russians who could do this. They had to hire somebody from Denmark. But the fact is, the Russian got here first and made it back in one piece, and the Dane got here second and never got back. But the, the Dane gets all the credit. <laughs> There's something a little unfair about this history. Alexei Chitikov is responsible for the panhandle of Alaska being part of Alaska. In any case, uh, what did the Russians claim? It's kind of amazing. That's why I say it wasn't true that he was going back into the Bering Sea because he didn't go there. More than that, each ship had a series of brass plaques with a cross on it, about the size of a shoebox, not very large. And the inscription, all in Cyrillic, fancy Cyrillic characters, 
basic, basically says this land is under Russian Sokrania. Sokrania protection. Not ownership. What the Russians were claiming was, we've got the first option to buy. We were the first Europeans who are here. And therefore, wherever we set up a trading post or a settlement, <coughs> as Baranov had done, you would negotiate with the local native people and purchase or rent or buy or whatever that site for your purposes. But the ownership of the land is the indigenous people. The Treaty of Sale of 1867 specifically says the land well, it, it's a list of all the trading posts. The Atkin trading post, the Aptu trading post, the Unalaska trading post, the Bristol Bay, Fort Alexander, Nishikak River trading post, the St. Michael trading post, the Kodiak trading post. The company was going out of business like Sears Roebuck. <laughs> and they sold the assets of the company to the United States, all the warehouses and docks and uh, buildings, for seven and a quarter million dollars. That's what the United States bought in 1867. The treaty specifically says the land belongs to the people who use and occupy it, meaning the Alaskan Native people. And they shall be accorded American citizenship because they had already been considered citizens of the Russian Empire. So you were citizens of Russia, now you're going to be citizens of the USA. Those stipulations of the treaty were completely ignored by the US government. They acted like, from the very beginning, they owned the place that they had bought real estate. And you read this in our history books, two cents an acre. But it's not true. The Russians did not consider themselves the owners of the land, and therefore could not have sold it. And you even hear this in some other, who were the Russians to sell our land? They weren't selling the land. The treaty specifically says so. And the treaty specifically says, and the native people of Alaska will be subject to whatever laws the United States government shall enact. It took Congress 104 years to enact anything. And that was only because the oil up here in Prudhoe Bay was discovered. And in the 1970s, the oil companies wanted to build what is now the Alaska Pipeline across all this land. And the Native people said, not across our land, not without our permission. <laughs> and, the, and the oil companies said, well, what do you mean? The US government bought all this from Russia 104 years ago. And the people said, read the treaty. And so, uh, in 1971, Alaska was actually purchased a second time. Mm -hmm. The federal government had to, to extinguish the native claim on the land. They paid Alaska native people about a billion dollars, a little less than a billion dollars, which is four dollars an acre. It's still not that great, but there are a lot of glaciers. So, <laughs> it's probably the best deal the Alaska native people could have wrangled from Congress at that time, and that's how the pipeline was built, but it's also how uh, Alaska was divided by, into 12 regions. The area we're visiting is called Sea Alaska Corporation. It includes the Tlingit tribe and the two non-Tlingit communities, Metlakatla, which is Simpsian, and Heidelberg, which is not on our list, on our map, the two non-Tlingit. But those three tribes, two of, one, one village each for the Haida and the, and the Simpsian and all the others Tlingit, they received their share of the billion dollars. And their corporation then was supposed to invest that so that for generations to come, they could, the tribe would benefit from the investment of this income. The same is true for the other 12. My wife is a uh, shareholder in what is called Chalista, which is the Yupik word for worker. And the, the 55 villages in that area have their corporation, and their corporation is supposed to invest their money and their resources so that whenever they have the dividends, shareholders forever will receive some kind of benefit from the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. If they had divvied up the billion dollars among the people who were alive in 1971, the people in 1972 would have all bought new trucks. <laughs> and by today, it would all be gone. So I think it was very wise of the government not to turn over that much money and just divvy it up among the individual uh, Alaska Native people, it was given to these corporations, they're, co they're called uh, Native Corporations, and there are 12 of them, and the entire state was divided up into these 12 regions. Some of the corporations have done very well, some of them have gone bankrupt and then been revived, but they still exist, and people, instead of being just tribal members, became shareholders in their tribe.
and uh, downtown in, in Juneau, uh, City Alaska Corporation has one of the larger buildings in downtown Juneau, and they've recently built a museum of Tlingit history and culture. Uh, and it's like one or two years old. I haven't even been in it myself yet. Mm -hmm. But it's, it might be something, a place for you to visit uh, to see. Now, Tlingit. The Tlingit people resisted. They had this battle with Baranov. So there, were, uh, and there had been that intermarriage, and there were more intermarriages as time went on. But the Tlingit people pretty much resisted Christianity. They were the vast majority of people in this whole region until 1892, when Joe Juno and Richard Harris discovered gold at Juno. The Tlingits knew there was gold. The Russians knew there was gold. They often say the Russians sold Alaska coast. There's no more money to be made. It's also completely false. The Pribilof Islands, St. George and St. Paul, have millions, literally millions of fur seals. The government made millions of dollars every year on the harvest of those fur seals. Fur seals are rather weird animals. The males develop harems. One bull can have 20 wives. But that means the others don't get any wives at all. You have all these bachelor seals who are completely useless. They take up space and they eat a lot, but they don't. But they don't mate and they don't produce offspring because the one bull takes the most. So it's the the the, the herd has to be trimmed, has to be uh, cold. 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 because otherwise the population would rise to the point where it could collapse and I mean all the seals would be starving. So the Aleut people were placed there on these two islands by Baranov originally to harvest so many fur seals every year to keep the population down and the, and the herd healthy. And of course they made millions of dollars off of that. So it was win-win. <coughs> and when the, when the United States took over the Pribilof Islands, at first the Japanese, the English, and, uh, and, the, and others uh, began raiding the Bering Sea and killing the fur seals at sea. But the problem with that is if you shoot a fur seal in the water, the tendency is, it, is for it to immediately sink. So you were killing the seals and not harvesting anything, just waste, basically wasting and depleting the, the herd. So there was almost war over this in the 1880s, and the countries got together and they said, okay, no more killing fur seals at sea. No more pelagic sealing. Seals can only be killed on the two Pribilof Islands and only by alligators. Hmm. That meant that you could take a count of how many bachelor seals there were and come with a reasonable statistic of how many seals need to be uh, killed each year. The government was still going to make millions of dollars. When well, they say that the Russians sold because there was no more money, it's nonsense. <laughs> they knew there was gold in Juno. The Tingas knew there was gold in Juno. But the Tingas didn't value gold. Gold was too soft. They liked copper. It was harder. And they liked the texture and the color of it. The Tingas were not interested in gold. So Joe Juno and uh, Richard Harris they didn't find the gold. The Klinker chief showed them where it was. <laughs> they didn't know that 20,000 Americans were going to show up next week. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that this is another reason why the Russian imperial government decided to sell Alaska to the United States. The British were pushing, were coming down to the coast. And the British were their number one rival around the world. The British were always the one who stopped the Russians from moving any, any further into Persia, into Iran, into the Middle East, into Turkey. It was always the British who were their nemesis. And the British are coming into Alaska. They know there's gold. If word gets out that there's gold in them thar hills, we know what happened in Colorado, Pikes Peak or bust. We know what happened in San Francisco, the 49ers. There will be tens of thousands of Americans here overnight. How many Russians are there in all of Alaska? Less than 800. Mm -hmm. And we just had the Crimean War. The British could have seized Alaska easily, but for some reason they both agreed that North America was neutral, out of bounds, there wouldn't be any fighting in North America. <coughs> Otherwise, in, in the 1850s, Alaska would have been seized by the Canadians, by the British, and that would have been the end of Russian America, and Alaska would be part of Canada today. But fortunately, they agreed not to fight in North America, but the Russians saw the handwriting on the wall. Alaska was there like a plum to be picked by the British, their arch rival. Or we can sell the assets of the Russian American company cheaply to our best friend, the U.S. of A. <laughs> and what are we selling? 
the real estate, the warehouses, the docks, the assets of the company. It's a company going out of business. And that's why it was sold for a quarter, seven and a quarter million dollars to the United States. They were going to lose it anyway. You're going to lose it either to your worst enemy or your best friend. We know now they were willing to sell for five million. So their negotiators got 50% more than they expected. <laughs> and that's how Alaska was transferred then to the United States at Sitka on October 18, 1867. The Russian governor, Prince Maksutov, and his wife, and uh, an honor guard of uh, maybe a dozen Russian uh, military men, lined up on what we call Castle Hill. It's very strange because there was never a castle and it's not much of a hill. <laughs> and they call it Baranov's <coughs> Castle and it was built after Baranov died by 20 or 30 years. So why it was Baranov's <laughs> Castle, I still have never figured out. But anyway, Baranov's Castle, Castle Hill, they put up two 60-foot flagpoles. Now why would you need 60-foot flagpoles? Normal flagpoles maybe 20 feet. These are three times higher and made of Sitka spruce. The reason was simple. The two sides, the Americans, who had come to, to perform this ceremony, and the Russian governor had negotiated that they weren't going to make any long speeches. There's no place for much of a crowd to gather on Castle Hill, maybe a couple hundred people. The whole town could not stand there and listen to long speeches, and most of the people in Sitka weren't real happy about this anyway. So we'll make the speeches short, and you can almost memorize them. On behalf of His Imperial Majesty, Tsar Alexander II of all the Russias, I hereby transfer our American colonies to the government of the United States. And Captain Rousseau on the part of the United States, on, be on behalf of the President and Congress of the United States, I hereby receive um, one sentence each. That's how quick the speech is. <laughs> but then they had decided that they were going to lower the Russian flag for the last time from its 60-foot perch and raise the American flag and simultaneously have a cannon salute so the Russian cannon at the base of the hill would fire the first shot, and the American naval vessel in the harbor would echo, then the Russians, then the Americans. Each one, so to, to fire 42 cannon shots is going to take some time. So you need a, you need a tall pole so that you have enough time for the Russian flag to slowly come down and for the American flag to slowly go up. It's a, and the, the American captain probably had to use a telescope out in the harbor because he couldn't tell when the speeches were going to be done. They didn't have, you know, iPhones in those days. So they had to watch the Russian flag and time their, their salute. Well, it didn't work out very well. <laughs> they both made their speeches. The Russian flag started to come down. The American flag started to go up. But far above, within 10 feet of the very tip, the Russian flag got wrapped around the pole. <laughs> the boatswain at the bottom started pulling on it, the Russian flag started to tear. <laughs> Three American sailors began to shimmy up the pole. They got 30 or 40 feet up, but still 20 feet from the flag. <laughs> they were out of steam. They couldn't go any further. They were stuck. Now we've got the three sailors stuck on the boat. There, there's no way to stop the cannon. <laughs> right? The Russians are still shooting off their cannon down at the bottom of the hill. The Americans are still shooting off their salute out in the middle of the harbor. <laughs> Finally, a clinket man was hoisted up. He pulled out his knife and began to cut the Russian flag free. The people on the on the land, on the shore, were yelling out, bring it down, bring it, he couldn't hear them, it was too windy. <laughs> so he dropped the Russian flag. The Russian flag came down like a, like a, a parachute and fell over the fixed bayonets of the American honor guard. Uh, at which point the Russian governor's wife fainted. And that's how America took possession of the <laughs> Every October 18th, the people of Sitka reenact the ceremony. <laughs> but I guarantee you, they have never reenacted it the way it really happened <laughs> on the first, we call it Alaska Day. So we're coming to Sitka, Castle Hills at one end of the street. The battlefield where the Klingons and Baranov did their struggle in 1804 is at the opposite end. In the middle of the street are the two sites that we will focus on. St. Innocent Benyaminov's house, with his own possessions still there. Uh, the first floor was the school, but it's not set up as a school now, it's set up as a museum. But it was dormitories and classrooms in the day of, of St. Innocent. And upstairs are his, and there's a chapel, St. 
uh, Holy Annunciation Chapel on the second floor, where we can deduce now six Orthodox saints have lived in that house. Wow. Starting with Saint Innocent Veniamino, and when we get to the house, we'll talk about Saint Yakov Nezvetov, the first Aleu priest, who was assigned to Atka and spent 20 years at Atka, twice as long as Veniamino. Yeah. His wife died. He's buried in Sitka. Her grave is there too. He petitioned for retirement. I've been 20 years in the Aleutian Islands, also by kayak, all the way to Japan. He, his island, he had the Europe Island south of Kamchatka, north of Hokkaido. He was going by kayak even further. 20 years. I petitioned to retire. My wife has died. My house burned down the same year. He had a tragic life. He translated the Gospels of Mark, Luke, and John into Aleut. He ran the Aleut schools in his region. He petitioned Father St. Innocent for retirement. Innocent wrote back, Father Yaakov, you certainly deserve to retire. 20 years in the Aleutian Islands and the tragedies that you have faced, your house burning, your wife dying. You can retire as soon as I find a replacement. <laughs> <laughs> 18 years later, <laughs> he retired, and he spent 16 of those years in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta, where he learned the Yupik Eskimo language, translated the first text into Yupik after devising an alphabet for the Yupik people, opening the first schools, worshiping in a tent for a dozen years, Pasca at 20 and 30 below zero. <laughs> And, and when he was older, he was only in his early 60s, in retirement, he was summoned to Sitka, where he died in the Russian bishop's house. Mm -hmm. And is buried in Sitka, the second great saint of Sitka. The third is Patriarch Tika, who as, as Metropolitan uh, Archbishop of North America, had the title Archbishop of the Aleutian Islands and North America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The alley was like that. You have a map of the Illusion Islands and North America in the corner. <laughs> but St. Patriarch Tika, the future Patriarch of Moscow, lived in this house also whenever he came. That was his residence when he came. He brought with him a man, a seminarian, Sergei Samarilovich. Sergei Samarilovich was sent to the Illusion Islands to Unalaska, in fact, to teach at the at the Orthodox public school, pri private school, parochial school, came back to Sitka and was ordained deacon at St. Michael's Cathedral and priest at St. Michael's Cathedral. And then he was sent to Prince William Sound where he served in the Aleutic language. We found his, his liturgy book in Aleutic only recently to realize that he was serving in Aleutic, serving this region, Prince William Sound, Valdez, Cordova. And then he came back to Sitka and went back to Russia with Patriarch Tikhon and became his vicar bishop, vicar, vicar bishop of Oblich, while, while patriarch was bishop of Yaroslavl. And when he became patriarch, he moved to Moscow to be also his right-hand man, vicar bishop. When patriarch Alex uh, Atikhan was arrested by the Bolsheviks and, and incarcerated at Donskoy Monastery, uh, this man, whose who's, uh, monastic name is Seraphim, this man Seraphim of Oblich, or Seraphim Samailovich, was for, for several months the locum tenens of the patriarchal throne. <laughs> and then he was arrested, of course, because that's what happened to all the Russian bishops in those days. I think he was arrested seven, eight, nine times. Oh, sent to different gulags all over Siberia and the north. And finally, in 1937, shot by the communists. Mm -hmm. But here's a man who came to Sitka, Alaska as a seminarian, became deacon and priest at Sitka, Alaska, mm -hmm. served in the diocese of Alaska, and became a martyr of the church uh, 40 years later. I have his photograph here too, I'll find it for you. But St. Seraphim of Sitka. In Sitka when we enter, there's the icon of the six saints of Sitka. And we can talk about the others when we're, when we're gathered in the place where they stood, in the place where they celebrated the liturgy, in some cases the place where they were ordained. Because all of them come together at St. Michael's Cathedral. The, I, the, the cathedral named for the icon that washed ashore as the only survivor of the battleship Neva, which was involved in the Battle of Sitka. You see, it's all connected and it all comes together on Lincoln Street in Sitka, Alaska. General's a completely other story, and I'll tell you that story when we get there. <laughs> Thank you.